All right. It is a Thursday morning, and that means at seven o'clock, only one thing needs to be on your mind, and that is the burning platform. It is our chance to check in on the most important current events of the week to find out what has been going on in the news. And we're joined, as always, by Pumi Mashiko, who is in the studio, along with Canton Pile. It's going to be a hell of a conversation this morning. Uh, Canton, why are you not on, uh, on microphone there? Let's just see I am on my carrot. Canton's <laughs> brought us. Canton's brought us a friend. He's brought uh, his daughter to the studio, but she's not oh. near a camera, so you can't see her. But she's got earphones, so people must okay. like watch watch yourselves with the swearing people. We're not yes, gonna like we, we, we please watch yourselves with the swearing, okay, Gareth right. and Canton. Well, my my I mean, offspring go, my offspring goes to high school, guys. <laughs> there is nothing right. that they do not say that. Is going Correct. to affect the years of most people. Yeah. So, yeah, well, so we'll also, I mean, there's, an, there's another reason you you shouldn't really swear or use foul language this morning, and that's because Helen Ziller is joining us, and we're going to check in with Helen Ziller. We haven't had her on the show for a long thank time. You. Helen, it's a great pleasure to have you on. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's been a tough time, but we all get onwards and upwards, that's all. Good. Keep well, I'm pleased to hear that. So we've, we've got quite a lot to talk about, but I think we'll start off with uh, Canton causing a lot of noise on social media, which he always does. And maybe you can comment on this first, Helen, but uh, here's Canton's tweet. That's which right. throw, us, throw us in the deep end, why don't you, Gareth? Well, I mean, let's go, because we, we don't really want to talk about the, the, the national shutdown, which turns out to be the national letdown. And I did see yesterday, and we can talk about this in a moment or two, that there was a vote to try and remove, there was a motion to try and remove the speaker. It failed in Parliament yesterday, but it was interesting to see who our parliamentarians are because they, for the first time in a long time, on news, they followed it live and we could see who our actual representatives in Parliament are. Interesting uh, little uh, hour of my life that I won't get back, but it, it did provide me with some useful information. So, Helen, what do you think of this tweet of Canton's? He said, the uh, as the, uh, the the swearing that we promised we wouldn't do in our DA is that instead of focusing on stuff that they do well and everyone else salutes, service delivery, clean audits, day zero, they preach stuff that is inherently divisive: vaccines, Ukraine, Zimbabwe, rainbow crosswalks. I still have no one to vote for. So I'm going to let you go first here, Helen. You are the national chairperson of the uh, the national federal chairperson. So perhaps you want to address uh, whether or not you think Canton has a good point here. Look, that's a typical tweet. A trite throwaway brain fart, frankly, that doesn't begin to get to the heart of why people vote and what they vote for. The bottom line is this. When you vote, you've got to understand what you are voting for and what the alternatives are. And you've also got to understand that almost everything in South Africa is divisive. Canthon himself started a political party with perhaps the most deliberately divisive name that they could come up with, which is the Capitalist Party of South Africa. Now, if you want a word that divides people fundamentally on the basis of race, irrespective of whether they understand the intricacies of economics, it is the word capitalism. And of course, Canton and his mates did that in order to be deliberately divisive because they know that politics is a binary thing and that it offers choices. Now, it's not that we go around preaching things. It's that as a political party, we deal with topical issues and you have to have a position on topical issues. And every position you ever take is divisive. If you, for example, say in South Africa, we stand for non-racialism, there'll be a huge number of people who disagree with you. If you say we would like all race laws to be removed from the statute book, there are a very large number of people who disagree with you. When Russia invades Ukraine against international law and violates a rules-based international order, a serious political party doesn't just sit there you have a foreign policy and you take a position. Obviously, not everyone's going to like your position, but no one has a position on anything that everybody likes. Politics is about the binary and it's about making choices. 
Yesterday, when I, or the day before yesterday, when I was canvassing for a by-election that we're having, and we do a lot of phone canvassing, I called a person in a local by-election who said, I'm not voting for the DA because of your position on LGBTIQ+. I said, sir, this is a local by-election. It's got nothing to do with our position on LGBTQI+. It is about whether there is water in your taps. It is about whether mm -hmm. your refuge is removed. It is about whether your streets are swept and the grass is cut. And frankly, our position on LGBTQI plus does not come into it. Your options are between the DA and three other parties who you know will either loot the fiscus or do nothing. That is your choice. Now, there are many, many voters who don't like what we say about one thing and therefore claim they have no party to vote for. So they're prepared to get fixated on the one thing they don't like that the DA says, and then <laughs> facilitate the election of parties that stand for grand corruption and a mafia state. That's what the All alternative right. is. Well, let's let uh, let's let Kansas defend his tweet, and and then we'll move on to some other questions because I don't want to get stuck in the mud on this. But go on, Kansas. Celebrity death match. Look, <laughs> I, I think that we could go back and forth on this. I'm, I I take Helen's position, and I stand by my position, which is basically, if we are going to rally people around stuff that's actually going to persuade people to get to the polls. Remember, we had 11 million people who did not go to the polls in the last election. Now, if those 11 million people were going to the polls, then we would be able to topple our thieving overlords very quickly. And from my perspective, it's very clear. The way in which we end up toppling those thieving overlords is by focusing on the stuff that's going to bring people together. And the DA does a lot of stuff that actually people agree on. And we just have to look at the phenomenal job that Chris Pappas is doing out in the Guinea Mayor municipality as an example of how if you just focus on the messaging and change the messaging so it's only about delivery, people will come to the polls. And the issue for me, guys, <clears throat> so in the last municipal elections, obviously I voted DA in my ward for exactly the reasons that uh, Helen has been outlining. But the fact of the matter is that we are not going to persuade the 11 million people who didn't vote to come to the polls unless we are actually focusing on the reasons why they should come to the polls. And the reasons why they should come to the polls are exactly the things that the DA does well. But the DA doesn't spend enough time talking about that in public. The stuff that gets amplified in public by the likes of, uh, of Alan Windy, who really, he goes and picks on, uh, uh, on people who end up saying things with regard to vaccines, again, that are hugely divisive. Why? Why not just shut the fuck up, focus on the stuff that you do well, which is that the Western Cape is the best run province in the country. And just keep talking about that. When it comes to your tweets, you know, start off by the morning by saying, here's a team out in the Western Cape that's refurbishing this road surface. Okay, then when the afternoon uh, comes along, show the, the smooth flow of traffic based on the fact that traffic lights are actually working and keep hammering that sort of messaging home. People will get up and say, I want to go to the polls. But that's not the stuff that people but, enjoy. Uh, are, you, and, and, yes. are, you offering, are you offering this as like a free <laughs> advice for, for Helen on a Thursday morning? Helen, did you want this free advice or is it unsolicited and unwelcome? <laughs> it's, it's, it's all... Look, well, I, <laughs> I think Helen's <laughs> living under a rock because we do that every single day. We do that every single day. We have all the social media platforms from Twitter to TikTok and everything in between amplifying our governance successes. But the point is we don't only run Umgeni, which is a small municipality in KwaZulu-Natal. We're very pleased to run Umgeni. And there, obviously, Umgeni amplifies its local government successes all the time. We also are in Parliament. We also have a shadow minister of foreign affairs or international relations, as it's now called. We have all those people. And I can assure you that if we were saying nothing on Ukraine with our government, 
being the international pariah on the subject, we will be fundamentally failing in our duty. Actually, we no, I'm going to disagree with that point fundamentally because the international pariahs at this point, if you draw a map of the world and look at who has supported the votes against Russia, it's entirely the Western world. This is a white well, people's the, war, Helen. Absolutely, this is a white people's no, war. Do, it's consider a war the fact of India, right? India, the world's biggest democracy, Helen, the world's biggest democracy has taken a neutral stance on this war. China, the it's world's second biggest country, has taken, it is not a war against the rule of law. It is a war against the fact that the US has consistently broken its word in terms of not expanding its borders right up to the doorstep. And I promise you, if my neighbor is going to turn around and plant machine guns that are pointed directly into my yard, I'm going to do something about it. All right, now, so you I, now, I, I have you decided, have but, but more, more crucially, the, the majority of the South, for want of a better word, is taking that view. Why is it that we now have the scenario that Brazil is now rallying around Russia You've actually had for the first time this alliance between the Saudis and the Iranians now coming together. There is going to be a BRICS-based currency that is going to supplant the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is on the verge of collapse because they have printed more U.S. dollars in the Biden administration that ever existed in the course of history. Now, at the point at which the global financial system collapses, where the hell is your rules-based order going to be, Helen? You guys have your heads so firmly up your asses that you don't understand the seismic shift that's happening in the world right now in terms of this foreign policy. And I promise you that a year from now, you are going to look back on this war and you will see how fundamentally the world has been transformed, particularly in terms of the agreement that was signed between the Russians and the Chinese over the past couple of days. Read that with great detail, because right now, the block that we have in terms of Russia and India and China and Brazil is the world's biggest economy, not the U.S. And they are the single growth point for us from a trade point of view. And if we are not shifting our focus as a country to the West and getting our heads out of the asses of the United States, we are going to be totally reamed. So I'm very clear about that. I, I listen. I mean, we, we expect this kind of forthright conversation. Uh, it's always welcome. And I only have Helen for another ten minutes. I know Pumi's got some questions for her too. Um, can I just say that yesterday it was quite interesting to watch? I mentioned this in the introduction. Uh, who our parliamentary representatives are, because during a vote of no confidence for the speaker, they actually make each member of parliament stand up and then have to vote yes or no or, or abstain. I noticed the DA all abstained in a block. Um, the ANC obviously voted no. Some of the other parties voted no. And then the EFF alone. And I think ATM were the only one who voted yes. So it failed spectacularly. But it was interesting to see who our members of parliament are. And, you know, this is something that uh, I think is, is a valid point worth, worth making and remarking on since we're talking to the national chairperson of the, of the DA's uh, federal council. Uh, the DA is the most diverse party in parliament. I mean, this is this goes without saying. There are there are more people of all kinds and creeds and colors and ages and variety than in any other party. Uh, that's quite an achievement, Helen. It's something you've been banging the drum about for a long time, right? Well, absolutely. It's a fact that very few people want to recognize. Even the other day, Annika Larson, no less, said in an interview that the DA caucus in Parliament was Lily White. I thought, have you also been living under a rock for so long? We are the only diverse party in South Africa, and we are the only one that draws its support base from all racial groups. For example, one-third of our voters are black, one-third are brown or coloured, and the other third are white. There's no other party that can claim that. And that is an extraordinary achievement in a country like South Africa. And those are the people who genuinely want non-racialism. And of course, that concept is very divisive. There are many people who want a country only for black people. There are other people who want a country only for white people. And so we can go on. We know who Gayton McKenzie appeals to. So mm. ethnic racialism is a very popular thing in South Africa. 
And Kanthan would say the DA is divisive by saying it's not our future. We have to stand together across racial lines to build a country jointly. And people don't like that. But that's too bad because that's the DA's policy. And not everybody is going to like what we say. We aren't trying to appeal to people who fundamentally differ from our values. We're trying to appeal to people who can resonate with what we say. And whatever Kanthan says about the emergence of a new international order, we should all be very worried. Because if force is going to be the way in which international relations are developed and in which sides are chosen, then we're in for serious trouble. This sounds like the end of the Weimar Republic in Germany to me and the annexation of Poland. If we're going to talk about <laughs> yeah, force I... being the model, it's 20 years since the Iraq war. Let's talk about force there. Let's talk about force that was used in Libya. Let's talk about force that is used in Syria. Why does the DA never say anything about the fact that there are countries currently invading the DRC? We don't yet talk about that. Why do we not talk about the fact that the U.S. has troops on the ground in Somalia? We don't hear the DA talking about that. So well, the DA is very selective. The D DA, too. yes, exactly. So why the selective targeting of what actually goes on in Ukraine because, when there is a pattern of this being happening? Because the troops are doing different happening? things. But we can't go into... I mean, the troops are doing different things. We're in so-called peacekeeping forces across the country continent because there are wars all over the place that have incredibly bad spin-offs for the continent and the people as a whole. But let's not go into all of this. The point that I'm making is that the reason to vote in South Africa is to save this country from a failed mafia state. That's the overriding reason. The reason to vote in South Africa is how are we going to save this democracy? You may not agree with what the DA does here or there or in Ukraine or in Somalia. But the bottom line is this. Can we save this democracy? Or are we going to become a criminal well, mafia state that we already are? And can we turn that around? That's the reason well, to vote. You know, I think you, if if anything, you both agree on the fact that there is serious reason to vote. And what you are disagreeing about is what are the things that are going to get people to the polls? But one exactly of the things, right. and, and just talking about the fact that nobody speaks a lot about the leadership of the DA or how diverse the DA is. On this show, I often talk about how we know very little also about most of what the DA platform is. And that's because we don't see a lot of it in mainstream media. And we've, the DA's got an election coming up, internal elections. We haven't been speaking a lot about that. But what I did see, um, Helen, is that 16 years in, you are once again running uh, for the position of chairperson of the Federal Council of the DA. And I'm just wondering why you believe that even after a 16-year run, you haven't done what needs to be done and you need to run again for another term. I'm running for a different position from the one that I started on in 2007. Let me just do the calculation. It probably is that long, 16 years. But the point is that I've been nominated and I'm uncontested. So somebody somewhere must think I'm doing a good job. And not only someone, but many, many people, because in the DA, people contest positions all the time and they are welcomed and invited to do so. So, I didn't nominate myself for this position and anybody else could have been nominated to contest me. That's what we welcome in the DA. And so I've got a lot of so energy does that going. Mean that, so does that mean that the DA or people who are nominating you in the DA don't see other people as viable leaders of this party? Is there a succession problem in the DA? No, there isn't a succession problem. We've been running a young leaders program since 2007 We've got some wonderful up-and-coming leaders. Chris Pappas is one of them. Jordan Hillus is one of them. Retief Urdendahl is one of them. Tyron Gray is one of them. We've got a whole range of extraordinarily good re leaders. Look at our presiding officers over our Congress. Dr. Mimi Gondwe is there. Bridget Masango is there. If you look at the leadership of the DA, it is, and you can laugh about this, Pumi, but when you talk about the diversity of leadership, you go and take a look at the leadership of any other party 
and see whether it comes anywhere close to the diversity of the DA's leadership. None of them come anywhere close to the diversity right. of the DA's leadership. One, one I'm not running thing. for the leader of the party. I'm running for chair of federal council. And in fact, I've been nominated and elected unopposed. So I'm not running anymore. People believe that I know how to run things, that I know how to manage things, that I know how to align things, that I know how to work 18 hours a day, which I do, that things don't fall through the cracks. And mm. we're the only party that can run a viable organization, the only one in the whole country that can do that, that can run Helen. due process, have systems and structures that function. Why do you think that is? Uh, can, can I throw in one last question? Because I know we've only got a few minutes left with you. Um, and I know, you know, Canton still wants to talk international stuff and there's lots of other stuff on the agenda. But quickly, Yonder says to me, Gareth, you have to ask Helen, what is the DA vision and why should we vote for the DA? I mean, there we go, the elevator pitch. Right, the elevator pitch. The DA's vision is a country that is prosperous and peaceful, where people see themselves as South Africans first, before they define themselves in terms of their race. The DA sees a society in which everyone has an opportunity to be the best they can be, where the government is clean and honest and creates opportunities for people and defends their rights and especially their freedoms. And we believe in a country that has a social market economy, which encourages investment, job creation and growth and lives in, at peace with its neighbors and is amongst the community of demo democracies worldwide. That is the DA's vision, and it can be achieved. We're currently sitting in a mafia criminal state, which is the dead opposite of the DA's vision. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to uh, let you carry on with your busy day, and thank you again for joining us on the show. It's always good to see you and to hear from you, and it's good to see someone who's actually prepared to spar with Canton every now and then. Which is, but uh, I want to say that I 100% endorse that elevator pitch, <laughs> unreservedly. <laughs> well, that's the reason to vote. That is the reason to vote, Kantan. And I'm saying focus on that messaging. <laughs> you focus on it every day. That, you don't. You are the kind of, uh, no, you are the kind the of reason why you have a reason not to yonder, vote for the DA. Yonder, ha yonder had to ask the message. To vote yonder the had DA. to ask the message because Yonder didn't know. Well, the point All right. is, we never stop talking about that message. And people who don't want to vote for the DA will look for every reason not to, rather than the millions of reasons to do so. That's the problem. Do you feel, just quickly, Helen, do you feel that the media gives you an unfair uh, run? They don't give you as much of a chance as they do other parties. I mean, you, you know, Pumi mentioned the mainstream media. We don't hear this. The bottom line is the media has always been massively unfair to the DA and always held up an extraordinary double standard to the DA. It is quite amazing what other parties get away with. And any minor issue that the DA does is held to a completely different standard, blown entirely out of proportion and misrepresented. We're very used to that. It's always been that way. And we've lived and we've survived through that. And the last book I will probably write if I um, still have it all together to do so when I'm 95, is the book about how the DA's warnings and positions were right and the media got it wrong on every single key issue. Well, we will wait with anticipation for that book, even if it does take another, uh, how, many, how many, I mean, 95 is still a way off, Helen. <laughs> a bit. A bit. <laughs> Thank at, you so much. At least 20 years. They're reversing aging in mice. There we are. <laughs> Thank you, Helen Zilla. Thank you so much. There she is, the uh, national chairperson of the DA's Federal Council, Helen Zilla. Um, I, I like. Uh, I do like it when you get all fired up, and when she got fired up and fought back. And um, I think we've got to pick up on that discussion just quickly. How do you see this this development of the new world order taking place, Canton? Because you you put the fear of God into Helen there, but maybe a bunch of other people are very confused. What exactly was in this Russia China agreement that was signed this week uh, by by Xi and and Putin? The short answer is that they've promised to defend each other's territorial integrity. So mm. now understand that territorial integrity also means that includes the fact that Russia unreservedly recognizes that Taiwan 
is an indivisible part of the mainland China. Mm. So now what that means is that at the point at which you then have the U.S. trying to perform their gunboat diplomacy and to try and cause trouble out in Taiwan, and on the assumption that it comes to a military confrontation out there, Russia is going to be on the side of China in that conflict. So it's going to be the pair of them that are now going to be united against the U.S. Similarly, you consider the fact that the territories that Russia uh, occupied uh, firstly in uh, Ukraine conducted referenda on those territories where the people overwhelmingly voted to join with Russia. And let's be very clear about that. Those Results were absolutely on par with exactly what happened in Crimea 30 years ago, where there Mm -hmm. was a referendum at the time where they wanted to join with Russia. But instead, the Russians said, no, actually, you guys can hang on and be part of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of what it means when the Chinese say that they are going to defend the territorial integrity of Russia, and the Chinese then recognize that Crimea and the Donbass, and pretty soon it will be Odessa as well, are indivisible parts of Russia. And at the point at which the U.S. is interceding, we are looking down the throat of World War III. So that that is the most basic uh, point at which we start off. Okay, the second thing to consider is the fact that the BRICS bank is going to be a reality. And it's going to be a currency that's going to be backed by real stuff. It's not going to be backed by the fact that the U.S. is going to topple your government if you refuse to accept that the dollar actually has supremacy in terms of global transactions. I mean, Putin also came out to say that they'll be using the yuan more in their trade with... They've already already started started doing that. I'm Uh, just saying that they're saying they're using it more, particularly now, you know, with, as you say, BRICS Bank, but also just in terms of Latin America, Africa and... Given Look, that they the, just had the Russia-Africa The national summit. currency thing already happens to some extent. Uh, so India is buying oil from Russia and paying in rupees, uh, as, as an example. Mm. Um, trade between the UAE, um, the Saudis, with uh, the Russians is now taking place in their own currencies. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has now printed an additional $2 trillion in order to prop up their banks. Now, money has to have value. So if you print $2 trillion out of nothing, correspondingly, Mm -hmm. it means that the value of all of the dollars in existence actually then has to be reduced because there is nothing that is actually backing it up. That is where inflation actually comes from. Now, the only thing that has propped up the dollar until now is the fact that the U.S. had the ability to actually declare war on you and take you out if you wanted to change currencies. Why was Saddam Hussein toppled? It's because he said he wanted to pay, be paid for oil in euros. So they took him out. Why was Hugo Chavez then ostracized? Because he said that he did not want payment in dollars for oil. He wanted to have payments in other currencies, particularly the euro. So again, he got sanctioned. Venezuela got taken out of the, um, the global economy effectively, and they crashed and burned. Libya was regime changed for the same reason. Mm. Okay. But now, um, yeah. You know, just just to throw this in there, there are a lot of people in the in the traditional Western media and in, in America and in the West who will say, oh, no, but that all sounds like conspiracy theory stuff, Canton. What what is the situation for South Africa? What well, well, how so- does it us? Because we're kind of <clears throat> we've been in the non-aligned movement for a long time, but it's clear that we are adjusting our foreign policy to go with Russia and China in the direction they want to lead us. Um, is this good for us? Is it bad for us? How, how will we find ourselves best placed? Well, this depends entirely on what our foreign policy stance is, uh, is going to be. And frankly, from my side, the best possible thing we could be doing is exactly what India is doing. India has taken a stance of absolute neutrality, but India has also taken a very strongly India-first policy. And what does that mean? India is spending uh, money on buying Russian oil. But right. again, you know, this is a question of people understanding how to actually uplift a country. Now, one of the things that uh, that Modi did when he took over India, 
which was hugely unpopular at the time, was that he drastically cranked up the price of fuel. Okay, if you think that we're heavily taxed in terms of fuel, the Indians were were heavily, uh, overwhelmingly taxed in terms of fuel. And at, at the time, there was outrage on the streets of, uh, of India around the fact that their fuel prices had gone up. What he then did was to take the cash that accrued from that dividend of having a higher fuel price, and he's poured that into development. So all of the infrastructure development that you see happening uh, in India comes directly from that dividend. All of the advances that India has been making in terms of its tech programs, its space programs, um, its weapons uh, uh, programs. Remember that uh, um, India and uh, Russia have worked together. They have a company called Brahmos, which is developing um, uh, ICBMs. All of that money has been coming from the fuel dividend. And so Modi has now been buying oil from Russia. So it's substantially discounted oil. He's getting it at around about 30 US dollars a barrel, but he's not reducing the price of fuel for Indians. Oh no, because all of that dividend in, is getting plowed back into what's going on. Now, now consider if Ramaphosa actually said, we're going to be buying oil from uh, from Russia. And I did the numbers on this last year, where yep. I, I, I said, if we have to end up being on the US's shit list, Remember right now, we benefit from the fact that we have the African Growth Opportunity Act, which basically says that AGOA countries are able to export to the U.S. without paying duty on it. Okay. So the situation that we have right now is because of the fact that our stuff enters the U.S. duty-free, there's an amount of money that accrues to us. If the U.S. tosses us out of AGOA, what is the benefit going to be with us then switching across to buying oil from Russia. And the overall benefit for South Africa, if we were to do that right now, is that we would have billions literally flowing into the fiscus based on the differential around what we are paying for fuel currently. And that, to my mind, is the level at which we should be talking about foreign policy. Foreign policy is not about sucking up to other countries. Our foreign policy should be determined by what is going to be in the best interest the best of South Africa. But that's the and that that Canton is <laughs> therein is the difference. You know, when you talk about if Ramaphosa, if you know our foreign policy minister Naledi Pando, if they had a strategy in place, if they had the political will and were thinking about more than just their pockets, but also thinking about the development of our country, thinking about how to get our economy up and running, thinking about how mm -hmm. to get millions and millions of young people into gainful employment, then you would be talking about a different thing. But that, they are not doing that. Our government, unfortunately, at the moment, is not even not even sleeping at the wheel. They are just not concentrating on what it is that we need as a country to get out of the doldrums that we're in. And unfortunately, I don't think any of the opposition parties that are on the ballot at the moment are doing likewise. Well, this is not something that the opposition can currently fix. No. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is that if, and again, you know, going back to the DA, because frankly, I believe that the DA currently is the only party that actually has the opportunity to actually grow its base sufficiently. But I'm also convinced that based on the tone deaf messaging that we are seeing right now, and, uh, and to a large extent, uh, the DA is doing exactly what the rest of the collective West is doing. When mm -hmm. they find that they're getting criticized for particular standpoints, like the war in Ukraine, they, the thing that they do is to double down. When Biden is yep. told your economic policies are failing, what does he do? He says, no, nope, we're actually going to stay the course. We're going to sanction oil and we are going to print more money. And, you know, things crash and well, burn. But the problem, but, you know, to get back to the, the point that uh, Gareth, that Pumi just uh, raised, the problem is that Ramaphosa, is very firmly in the pocket of the Americans. I'm very clear about this, while the rest of the ANC is not. And it's very clear to me that Ramaphosa is president because of the fact that he was able to buy votes at Nazareth. And so you're going to have the scenario where the ANC is not going to do anything. It's just going to be inertia, which is why you've got a minister of electricity, even though Guede has a plan in terms of energy, which I've largely agreed with, that we need to be exploiting our coal but Ramaphosa is not going to allow him to do that. 
Okay. We've had this entire ANC just tearing itself apart with inertia. And it is not um, going to fix itself. But let's hope Mashatile ends up recalling Ramaphosa, which I think he I, will I do, only do in 2024. I do want to hear what you guys think about, uh, and Pumi and I largely discussed the EFF and Julius on Monday, and, and whether or not that affected your life at all, Canton, whether you think it was a win for him, or do you think it was a disaster? I, th I think it's neither. I, th I think that we give far too much attention to the EFF. Really, the problem in our country is not the EFF. The EFF does not control a single municipality in this country. Even in Johannesburg, you know, Africa's financial capital, the EFF doesn't uh, control a single ward. The EFF's mm -hmm. influence in Johannesburg is entirely on the proportional vote. Why do we give these guys so much attention? Fine. We'll stop. That's uh, that's fine. We'll we'll end off on that. How do you feel about the ICC and their warrant for Putin? Because there was big fuss made about this and with uh, regard to Trump's possible indictment. Um, these were two non-stories because it's not as if anyone's going to march into Russia and arrest Vladimir Putin. And of course, Donald Trump himself, who made the biggest fuss about all of this, wasn't arrested. So again, we're being distracted, right? Well, remember that the uh, that not only does the U.S. not recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC, the U.S. also has an act um, mm. uh, on their on their books, which uh, I forget what the official name of it is, but it, it is codenamed the Hague Act. And mm. basically, the law which was passed in the U.S. says that if anyone in the outside world tries to enforce an ICC order against the United States, the United States is able uh, sanctioned. Not, not to sanction, to do anything to actually ensure that it doesn't get enforced, including military action. So in other words, if you try and arrest any U.S. citizen um, on the, the premise of a warrant that gets issued by the ICC, the U.S. will come and they will invade your sorry ass and they will take their people out. Russia doesn't recognize the jurisdiction of the, uh, of the ICC. India doesn't recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC. Uh, China doesn't recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC. It's just we a bunch are, of European countries. Well, we are signatories to the ICC because, mm. you know, we bought into the Rome Statute at the time. Because yeah, when, when Omar al-Bashir came here, we didn't arrest him, did we? <laughs> yes, but again, you know, how stupid would it be? We're inviting people to our country for peace talks, and then we say we're going to arrest someone. I mean, but again, heads of state, by definition, are exempt from warrants of arrest in terms of international law. That is UN law, you know, which in theory all of us subscribe to. And if again, they, if all they of want this to is the Hague, they must they know where his office is. If they want to, if they know where his office is. But, uh, you know, I, I must say you, that. What do, uh, of, what do you make of people who were very excited about this, that he was being uh, issued a warrant by the ICC? What do you make of those people? Clearly, they're because, just deluded. Idiots. Because they're clueless. I'll ask yourself how many people have actually been brought to trial um, uh, by the ICC. OK, the, uh, the starting point Slobodan, is that. Slobodan Milosevic. I can only think of one. Yes. And Slobodan Milosevic was the only people uh, person from Europe. Who was actually yeah. <laughs> exactly okay? Exactly. Otherwise, the ICC is used exclusively to target the Only third the world Africans. and particularly Africans. <laughs> Only the Africans. All right. Well, let's leave that one where it is. Do you want to throw anything about the uh, the Trump uh, uh, the indictment there? Do you think that that's even worth paying attention to, or do you think it was a big uh, nothing burger as well? No, flip. It was brilliant marketing <laughs> on the part of Trump. But uh, in fact, you guys touched on that earlier today. But right. yes, you know, the opportunity for him to actually fundraise. Here's, you know, yeah. The guy's brilliant. Make Here's an interesting mistake. point being made in the comments by Kevin. He says the IMF has slashed South Africa's 2023 GDP growth forecast to 0.1% due to the power crisis. Inflation's running at 7%. The net negative growth is minus 6.9. Absolutely spot on. Remember, we've we've talked on this show before about the path to prosperity for any country. It's very simple. Your economic growth has to outpace your population growth. It, it really is that simple. If you get GDP growth to the point at which it is larger than your population growth, you're going to have prosperity. 
That's how China has plucked itself out of poverty. That's how India is plucking itself out of poverty. They've got a 2% population growth. They've got 8% GDP growth. There's a net benefit of more mm -hmm. money for uh, per citizen every single year. We've gone consistently backwards under the Ramaphosa regime. And that's going to continue being the case because of the fact that they're not doing the things that can unlock the economy. But There's... the food prices and the inflation is also around the world. We're not the only ones. I mean, yesterday, the UK came uh, out no, with no, no, their hang numbers on a second. as well. No, hang on a second. Take the a... UK's numbers came out yesterday, and you they have the same Stop with this around the world stuff, having. Bumi. Talk about, have the food prices gone up in India? No. Have the food prices gone up in Russia? No. Have the food prices gone up in China? No. Why are our food and prices going up And that's why I'm specifically yeah. saying to you that the UK's numbers yesterday when they came out, I mean, their inflation is sitting at 10.4%. You know, they are also having a food price crisis. The U.S. is having a similar, which is why they are printing dollars. And this is the thing, right, is we, we cannot just look at South Africa in isolation. We have to look at South Africa and look at it in the global picture. We cannot. So it's Ramaphosa. There's no way that we can say that things are better. Even Ramaphosa doesn't know how to contextualize for us that things are Dire, that things are bad. You know, he he tries to say it in a way that makes so it let's, feel let's like. So let's take let's take a look know? at food price inflation in South Africa. At one very basic commodity, which is milk. Okay, <laughs> why I'm uh, okay. why is the price of milk going through the roof? The price of milk is going through the roof based on the fact that because we've had electricity shutoffs, we've not been able to keep milk refrigerated. That exactly. means that we've had to throw milk away. That means that there's less milk available in the market. And what happens is that when you have a shortage of a commodity, the price goes up. And yes, it right. ties back fundamentally with the idea of electricity not being available, which is, yes, it's exactly what uh, uh, the listener was saying just now, Gareth, that it's directly linked it's to the fact. Yes, no, it's, <laughs> it's the consequences of our lack of electricity. But again, so, we know how to fix this. We can burn diesel, which we did for the past three yes. days. And we've got lots of coal, we've got lots of diesel, we should be using it, as you mentioned earlier, we shouldn't be worrying about the first world supposed obsession with uh, climate alarmism. Here's Carl DeSantis who says, Canton, if Cyril goes and Paul becomes president, then we're almost guaranteed an ANC-EFF coalition. Are you sure you want Cyril recalled? Yeah, I'm absolutely sure I want Cyril recalled. Because look, frankly, <laughs> Why you you're not going to have an ANC-EFF coalition. Okay, what you're going to have is a plurality government. So the ANC is still going to be the biggest party, but any candidate that the ANC puts forward for, uh, for the president of the country is going to need the support of whoever makes up that gap between the ANC's plurality and 50%. So chances are that if Mashatila is put forward as, uh, as president, that there is an incentive for the DA to actually vote for him. And, and to put him in, uh, in office. Remember that at that time, because the ANC is going to be um, a government that does not have 50%, decisions will actually get taken in parliament. Mm -hmm. And remember that the ANC is not going to count out to a lot of the fundamental things that the EFF has been, uh, has been pushing for. So at that level, the ANC is going to have to put forward a budget if it gets the support of, uh, of the DA, the budget will get passed. If it gets support of the EFF, the budget will get passed. Do you think that, that this kind of plurality government that you're talking about will pull everyone else to, towards the center rather than towards the extremes? That's exactly what I'm, I'm hoping is going to happen. And, oh, look, the, and, and, and I think that if, if you consider, um, is the EFF actually going to grow its base? in the next election? I think the answer is no. I think they're hmm. going to decline. Yes. But I think. But at the same look... time, I don't think the DA is going to grow its base either. No, and neither, it's going to neither, decline. neither is the ANC. This <laughs> next election is entirely about getting undecided voters to the poll. But I think that the, the worst thing about the plurality that we're walking into at the moment is just watching what is happening in the municipalities and watching what is happening in those coalitions. Even... And unfortunately, our politicians are not a um, 
sophisticated bunch. They're not, they're not willing to put aside their differences long enough to be able to get things done because none of them care about getting things done. All look of them uh, care about the power, uh, you know? To your point, Pumi, look at what's happening in Tswane at the moment. I mean, there's just an absolute deadlock on getting a mayor elected, a mayor one position that we need to, to start getting things done. And of course, the, the ANC, the EFF, and I think uh, Gate and McKenzie's people are holding everything back at the it's moment. Pope. They're, they're <laughs> obstructionist. Cope. Correct. It's cope. <laughs> I mean, but, but you know, I think um, the hope, we're, we're humans after all, and, and we live for hope and we always hope for the best but i think what we are seeing in south africa is we're definitely seeing that what our politicians are more concerned with is they're more concerned with having the power over yeah. getting things done all of them so can all i quickly them. can i bring this up because one of our listeners who's very sharp here slippery pickle says what about the dutch local elections let's end on some good news and this is good news because as The Guardian, which is hardly going to be thrilled to report this, but here they report, a new populist party surfing a wave of rural anger at government environmental policies has emerged as the big winner in the Dutch provincial elections, dealing a heavy blow to the four-party coalition of the Prime Minister Mark Rutte. The success of the farmer citizen movement, called the BBB, in Wednesday's vote will now determine the makeup of the Senate and it casts doubt over the government's ability to pass key legislation, including its plans to slash, listen to this, nitrogen emissions. Because now, you know, carbon emissions aren't bad enough. Now we also have to employ all kinds of other stupid rules to get people to conform and to sell their property to the government so that they get out of farming and the government has more land, blah, blah, you blah. You know, the absurdity of the fact that our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. What we are breathing right now, it's 80% nitrogen. Guys. Listen, this is, this is this is the kind of the level of stupidity that a lot of these uh, climate alarmists, I'm going to use that term from now on because it's true, are throwing at people who are keeping the whole economy in Holland going, frankly. I mean, the farming community in Holland is tremendously effective and efficient. They are one of the most productive groups of people in the world. And the government has been on an absolute mission to destroy this, this community. Uh, they they're clearly fighting back, and they're getting a lot of support from other people in Holland. So this is good news. It's absolutely brilliant, and uh, you know, let, let's hope that the rest of Europe is actually going to you know get their heads out of their asses. And instead of you know shipping massive amounts of money off to fund a U.S. proxy war, you know, just imagine if you took that money and plowed it back into your own development. I mean, and use you know going back to the UK example just now, you have. Um, uh, the national health system, which is collapsing because of lack of funding. Yes. And meanwhile, you, you have this, this constant shipping of more money off to Ukraine. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's think, just simply doubling it, down. Yeah, I think that the, the biggest win of what's happened there with the Dutch is that the people, enough people went enough. And, and stood up and stood together for what they believe in. And it's, you know, it's kind of if, if we can learn from that as South Africans to kind of go, what are the things that we want to get done? And how do we, how do we wrangle the political parties that exist or find the ones that, that resonate with us and, and, and then mobilize to get those individuals into a position to make the decisions that we want made? Oh, Pumi. You know, it wishes for horses. <laughs> it's well, like um, hope. I'm still very excited about the prospect of our, our new electricity minister making an enormous difference and Sputla Ramachop as the guy. And obviously, this is an awesome way for the ANC to say, look, as soon as we appointed an electricity minister, things got better. And that's what they're going to say. And they did, in fact, get better for the past two days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then yes. I woke up this morning with the, the my... ESP app telling me that we're 55 minutes away from the next bout of load shedding. Yeah. So it was temporary. It's got to be sustained. Well, guys, <laughs> you know, if, if there's one thing that we can give credit to the EFF for, because of the fact that they stirred up so much emotion around this um, shutdown, okay, which on a public holiday when most people were taking the day off in any case, yeah, they showed that when necessary, the Ramaphosa regime can actually do law enforcement. The Ramaphosa regime can actually keep the lights on. The Ramaphosa regime can actually control traffic. 
all of the basic things that we want and that the only reason why it doesn't happen the rest of the year is because they just couldn't care. That's and so, exactly you know, right. so shout out to the EFF for doing that, really. I think that the single thing that they've shown us is that this country is not as broken as we think it might be. And a lot of what uh, um, is going on right now, we then have to turn around and say it's actually deliberate because it's pushing particular agendas. In the case of Ramaphosa, and considering that his family is so heavily invested in the green energy sector, we can immediately see who's going to be the beneficiaries of that. Hmm. So shout out, Julius. No, really. Well, okay. That, I mean, we that's literally, the, the, we literally have like four minutes left, and I so wanted to talk about the riots in France. Oh, my word, yes. <laughs> well, 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 let's, I, I, th I think Macron's going to fall. <laughs> Do you think so? I mean, I, I, Macron, I think Macron's going to fall. And be replaced by whom? Jean-Marie Le Pen? No, no, they're going to have to have elections again, really. But, um, yeah, but I, I, I think it, he's going to fall. Is it true, is it true that, um, that Russia is, is helping fund Jean-Marie Le Pen? I can't imagine why they would need to, because it, it's not as though the type of money that you've got I'm sorry, um, Marine, yeah. Marine Le Pen. I, I, uh, Marine Le Pen. The father yeah. was Jean. They do not get along, by the way. The, the father and the daughter have parted ways in a very dramatic fashion, even though he's yes. the founder of the party that she's now in charge of. Look, I think that Marine Le Pen has been on a steady um, upward trajectory uh, over, over the past years. And it's to a large extent, it's been because of the fact that uh, she distanced herself from the very, very clearly fascist tendencies that uh, that her father had. No, if anything, the money that's being poured into these countries right now is coming from the West. Mm -hmm. You know, very good example, if you take a look at what went down in Georgia a couple of weeks ago, where there was this uh, outpouring of rage against a law that was basically going to say, we don't want foreign money coming in and influencing our elections. And it's a law that, in fact, exists in the U.S. It exists in the U.K. But suddenly the Americans turn around and say it's anti-democratic. But here's the crucial thing for me in terms of what went down on that protest. You suddenly have hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets of Georgia. And guess what? They're all waving Ukraine flags. Now, tell me, you have hundreds of thousands of people who suddenly have this ability to spontaneously print Ukraine flags and take them out on the street? No. There's money that is being poured into that country by NGOs in order to sway opinion. That's the only way that this stuff happens. There is a level of organization that happens on the part of these NGOs, and they're all U.S.-funded NGOs. And they've effectively been able to effect regime change in most countries around the world, uh, in the West. So very clearly, the government in, in Finland is one of those soros pact governments. The government in Estonia is one of those soros pact uh, governments. The government in Sweden is one of those, uh, those soros pact governments. It's all because of the fact that you've had foreign money being poured in there. So, uh, yeah, is, is Russia supporting them with money? I don't think so. You Russia also, has difficulty. You can also only control the narrative so much, and eventually you're going to see what we've been predicting on the show for a very long time, and which frightens a lot of people, frankly, um, the fact that there are a lot of these countries that are going to revert to the right. And uh, you mentioned France. So we see what's happened in Holland now. We know Hungary has gone this way. Italy very much so. Um, so we're seeing all these European countries that have been swinging like the pendulum always does to the left. Now it's going to go to the right. The big worry there is that a lot of this will be anti-immigrant. A lot of it will be uh, quite, you know, sort of, what would you even you'd probably call it a reactionary? Right. No, on the other hand, what I, I think we should take the view that it's not so much a swing to the right as much as a swing to the concept of nationalism. And mm. I, I think to a large extent, the problem that we have right now as a country in South Africa is that we're not nationalist enough. You know, we really should be putting South Africa first in terms of our, our policies. Our policies should first and foremost uplift our citizens. You know, yes, by all means, we need to be um, welcoming of genuine refugees who are coming to our country, as opposed to people who have had plane tickets paid for them um, from Afghanistan to come down here. And it's American NGOs who are paying for those plane tickets to get them shipped to our country. You know, entirely different scenario. And, you know, I, I think we are right to say, uh, -uh you know, ship them back to the U.S. 
in that particular last, scenario. Uh, but we should be nationalist. Last word, Pums, anything you want to throw in there on this uh, topic? Yes, that the world is a shitstorm right now. <laughs> oh, God. All right, well, no matter where you look. Uh, let's, let's all get to work. We've got an economy to keep going. It's not going to be the government that does it. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next week for more of The Burning Platform. Thanks, Canton. Thank you. Great show today, guys. Yeah, and Helen, let's love you. <laughs> there we go. All right, everybody. Have a happy day. Bye-bye, yes. the best.